Good evening. I'm Lorraine Coons, Chair of the History Department at Chestnut Hill College. On behalf of the Departments of History and Political Science and the Women's Studies Program, I would like to welcome you to this conversation with Congresswoman Madeline Dean, who represents Pennsylvania's 4th District, Montgomery and Berks Counties. This discussion of women in politics in America is especially apropos as we celebrate Women's History Month in March. And yes, we have a lot to celebrate. Last August, we reached a milestone in commemorating the centenary of the passage of the 19th Amendment, which recognized suffrage rights for women in this country. And then on January 20th of this year, Kamala Harris became the first female vice president of the United States, a historic event. But the day was long in coming. The path for Vice President Harris was paved by many strong, capable, and determined women who broke through the glass ceiling of America's political establishment to ensure that women's voices be heard on the floor of Congress, beginning with Jeanette Rankin, who in 1917 became the first woman elected to Congress to represent her state of Montana to serve in the House. And since that historic breakthrough, she was followed by several pioneers of the last century. Women like Hattie Hyatt Carraway, Margaret Chase Smith, Shirley Chisholm, Bill Absom, and Barbara Jordan, who have all proven Rebecca Latimer Felton correct when she predicted to male congressmen in 1922, and I want to quote, when the women of the country come in and sit with you, though there may be but a very few in the next few years, I pledge you that you will get ability. You will get integrity of purpose. You will get exalted patriotism and you will get unstinted usefulness. In fact, Ms. Felton herself at age 87 became the first woman senator, albeit for 24 hours as a very interim appointment, but still what an achievement. Clearly she had women like Madeleine Dean in mind. Sister Carol Jean Vail, president of Chestnut Hill College, would like to extend a few words of welcome to the audience. Good evening. I'm pleased to add my welcome to that of Dr. Coons. Congresswoman Dean, it's a privilege to welcome you to Chestnut Hill College, even if it's virtually. It is my hope that you will, in fact, when you have the opportunity and COVID is over, that you will come and visit our campus. I have admired you from afar since you've entered into politics. When Dr. Coons no notified me that you participate in the event for Women's History Month, I was absolutely delighted. You can also imagine my surprise when I learned that your nephew, Terry Cunane, is a history major here and that a 2008 alumnus, Ko Chiba, is your chief of staff. I don't think I have to stretch the truth to say this is indeed serendipitous. I want to congratulate you, Congresswoman, on your outstanding presentations before the Senate during the recent impeachment trial of former President Trump. Thank you for your immense service in a difficult and intense situation. As we celebrate Women's History Month, it is notable that so many more women are now running for state and national office than they have in the past. Women's voices need to be raised and their perspectives valued. To finally have a woman, a heartbeat from the United States presidency, and to see so many women appointed to the cabinet is a sign of hope in the evolving roles women will play 
in determining the future of this country. Congresswoman, we are so glad that you are one of those women. Madeline Dean is no stranger to the Philadelphia area. She was born and raised right next door to us in Glenside, Pennsylvania. Having graduated from LaSalle University, she earned her law degree at Widener University and began her career practicing law. As her family grew, she switched from law to teaching, becoming a faculty member in the English department at her alma mater, LaSalle University. Later, she served as state representative for the 153rd district. During her tenure, Governor Wolf appointed her to the Commission for Women. Her time in Harrisburg was well spent as Congresswoman Dean co-founded the state's gun safety group and became a vocal leader for progressive issues. She has worked tirelessly to better the lives of women and their families, in addition to working assiduously to protect the environment, eliminate gun violence, and provide health care for all. In 2018, she won a congressional seat representing Montgomery and Berks counties. In Washington, she serves on the powerful House Judiciary and Financial Services Committees and is a champion for multiple progressive issues. In 2020, she was elected chair of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. You may be interested to know that Congresswoman Dean is a lifelong parishioner of St. Luke's in Glenside, a parish long the home of the Sisters of St. Joseph who taught there in the elementary school for decades. It is my pleasure to invite you to join me in welcoming Congresswoman Dean to Chestnut Hill College. Congresswoman, please continue to be a voice for integrity, truth, equality, equity, and inclusion. Never before were we so in need of courageous women and men intent upon the common good and the preservation of our rights and freedoms. Thank you for your service. Thank you, Sister Carol. As Sister Carol has mentioned, Congresswoman Dean has a special connection to us here. And I would like to now ask her nephew, Terry Kunane, and her chief of staff, Kochiba, to say a few words about the Congresswoman and their perspective. Hello, my name is uh, Terry, Terry Kunane. As many of you know, I'm Congresswoman Dean's nephew. She's married to my dad's brother, and we all come from the same little town just outside of Philly. As we speak today, I'm sitting in the same home formerly occupied by Walter Dean, the uncle of Congresswoman Dean. And this house is only five blocks from the Dean home on Roberts Ave. My family has always been political. Going all the way back to the 1960s, my grandparents were staunch supporters of John F. Kennedy. Kennedy, much like them, was an Irish Catholic and a member of the Democratic Party. His ideas and platform represented the implementation of the change that many Americans strived for during that time. Whether the fight was for better economic opportunities or racial equality, Kennedy, much like my gran grandparents, saw that these problems existed in our society and set out to see them fixed. Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. My family took this message to heart and they were, never the, they were never ones to sit on the sidelines and wait for change to eventually come. Instead, they took initiative and played an active role in their community to help foster the change they knew the country deserved. My grandfather helped run the Kennedy campaign in Philly and Madeline was heavily influenced by him. Words cannot express how proud I am of my aunt. To me, she represents a continuation of the legacy my grandparents left behind. That being said, I am beyond grateful for the work she has done thus far in Washington, D.C., and am extraordinarily appreciative of the opportunity to welcome her to our school today. Um, it's uh, very nice to be here, and um, as um, Professor Coons and um, uh, President Sister Carol Jean Bell said, I am a alum of Chestnut Hill, uh, year 2010, and so it is a really a, an honor and a privilege to be able to speak with you and, and say a few words. Um, my sister is also a graduate and my wife is also a graduate. So um, it's uh, triply special. And, and I know that I would not be here had it not been for uh, CHC and advisors like Professor Reich, who I think is somewhere in the crowd. Um, so thank you to that. I think my picture may still be up in uh, your classroom 
along with the, the other poli sci grads. So um, again, it's really a privilege to get to say a few words to you. Um, because it was at CHC that my passion for politics really prepared me uh, for the work that was going to be my career. Because um, it really starts now when you're students. Um, I've been working for a rep dean for 10 years now, uh, and it started as a campaign intern on her race for state representative. And it's been one of the most rewarding experiences uh, of my life. Um, so if you're considering entering public service, I, I really hope that conversations like this solidify that goal. Um, and, I, and I'll take this opportunity to, to make a quick plug for internships because uh, two others on our staff also start off as interns and they're now full-time staffers and one of whom is another CHC grad. So uh, two former students is not a bad uh, batting average, uh, Professor Wright. Um, I mean, we're always looking for passionate people to get involved in our office. Uh, we have internships in both D.C. and the district, and, and they are paid internships because the work that interns do is meaningful to our office and to our constituents uh, and their value. So being paid is, is uh, the least that uh, people should do to make sure that they know that, that their work is valued. So if you're interested, I hope that uh, my email can be shared around um, to find out more information about applying. Uh, and although Reb Dean will go into a little bit more detail, um, like I said, public service is one of the most rewarding jobs you can have. Um, they're not easy. Uh, sometimes you'll feel like you are in an episode of Parks and Rec, or sometimes there'll be impeachments or government shutdowns, and sometimes Carol Baskin will come lobbying uh, for Big Cat Rescue, but, but trust me, it, it really is worth it. Uh, you get to meet people who are in need and actually get to do something about it. Um, you also get to meet and work with incredibly bright and passionate people trying to affect change and, and get to learn from them. Uh, and if you're really, really lucky, uh, you'll get to work for someone like Representative Dean, who will inspire you when the days are long and remind you that the people that we've trusted to represent us really do work tirelessly to make this place a better, better world and give voice to those who feel like they have done. And then you get to know that you had a part to play in all of that. So, um, again, this is really an honor to be able to speak with you. And, and I do hope that you consider public service because I promise you will never regret Thank you both. And now it is my distinct privilege to welcome Congresswoman Madeline Dean. Well, I'm a little overwhelmed. Uh, I can probably only do harm. I should just let it go right there. You all introduced me so beautifully. Uh, but I am Madeline Dean. I am Terrence's uh, aunt, I'm Madeline Dean Canan. My married name is Canan proudly. Um, and so first, thanks to you, Terry. Thank you for thinking of me, for inviting me, for being proud of me. Uh, we share that. I'm super proud of you. And when you said you were going to Chestnut Hill, that they recognized your excellence, I couldn't have been happier. And there's a reason for that that I'll get to in just a minute. Chair Coons, thank you very much for your beautiful introduction. Uh, and I thank the history department, the political science department, uh, the women's studies minor uh, for including me in this conversation at all. And President Vail, uh, thank you for your beautiful introduction, uh, inspired by the things that inspire me. Uh, I can see why you have been such a powerful and extraordinary leader for Chestnut Hill College for all these years. So continue to do that. Don't retire too fast. Uh, but when you do retire, enjoy it. Uh, it's a, a real privilege to be here with you. I was thinking about this. Uh, there's a reason why I'm particularly uh, extra delighted because it's generational excellence. Look at me. I get to work with Cochiba. Yours is a college that prides itself on excellence. Excellence in educating women was your original mission. And of course, you, you added men to that as well. I think you began in uh, 1924. And guess who was graduated from Chestnut Hill College on June the 6th, 1944, on D-Day of all days, my own mother, Mary Eaton, Mary Eaton Dean, was graduated June the 6th, 1944 from Chestnut Hill, very proud alum. Uh, and, uh, and it was 15 years later on that very same day, because she always told me, I graduated on your birthday. I was born on June the 6th. 15 years later. She met my father who was going to uh, LaSalle College at the time. Uh, and I think they met in a play. I think the Chestnut Hill women would go and participate in plays. My father would boast that he had the lead. My mother was in the chorus. Well, it all worked out. 
Uh, they had a beautiful, happy marriage. I'm the youngest of, of their seven children. And so she was very proud. So Terry, in a funny way, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to dedicate this quick talk. I promise not to go on longer than this silly introduction uh, to two strong women, my mother, Mary Eaton Dean, and your grandmother, a force to be reckoned with, who was so proud of you, Joan Walsh Canan who worked in democratic politics, who was one of the most progressive women before progressive women even were recognized. Uh, and she was vilified for it sometimes, but she didn't care. And she was extraordinarily proud of Terry uh, and had a real hand uh, in, in your influence and your value system all to the good. So um, this is supposed to be a little fireside chat. I'm gonna give you a little bit of my history um, and then I'm very happy to open it up to questions. Uh, because I feel a little unworthy to be talking about important women in history. Uh, but I thought maybe if I tell you how I got to where I am, uh, maybe for some of you students and, and others, uh, you might see a little bit of yourself in me. Um, uh, I, I understand this is considered sort of a fireside chat. And you know that that term was coined by FDR uh, during World War II. However, as I was preparing for this, I really kept thinking over and over again, of the other Roosevelt, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, who in his famous speech at the Sorbonne in 1910, uh, the speech that has gone on to live forever as a speech about leadership and getting involved in politics and public service, or really getting involved in leadership in whatever your enterprise. It's his man in the arena speech. And the famous quote uh, where he describes what it is to be a leader is, and I'll quote it, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong, how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood and who strives valiantly. I am certain, or at least I'm gonna just take a point of personal privilege to say that Teddy Roosevelt really meant the man and the woman in the arena. And that's what we're here to celebrate this Women's History Month, the men, and most especially now, the women in the arena. Because when your time comes, I want you to say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to stumble along the way. Don't be afraid to get dirty and in the dust a little bit. Uh, my own path to Congress, uh, which I love so dearly, this public service, was not a straight line. I went to Abington High School. I went on to LaSalle University and then took a law course and realized I loved the study of law. So I went on to law school and I practiced law uh, in, in my younger days in Philadelphia and also opened a three woman law firm in Glenside back in the day when I was raising little kids, your uncles, Terry, uh, now all grown. Uh, then I had the chance, sister, to do something that I absolutely prized switch careers altogether, and I taught for 10 years at LaSalle University, uh, a JD in a sea of PhDs, but somehow they made me feel very welcome. Uh, and I always thank them for that. I was a member of the English department and taught writing and rhetoric and ethics, and uh, we developed undergraduate courses in legal writing. But I always knew from the time I was quite young that I wanted to get into public service. You see, the first time I ran for office, uh, Terrence, did I ever tell you this? was when I was 18. I was asked by a neighborhood friend, would you consider running for committee woman? And so I did. And I had a little campaign and I went door to door with handmade pamphlets that were Xeroxed. Uh, and with the first time I voted, I voted for myself and I won. Uh, and with that, the seed was planted, the bug was in me. I always knew I wanted to be involved in politics and public service and ethics in government. Uh, and so, on I went to get my claim my education. Um, but by the time I turned 50, and maybe I had been marking papers too long, I said, it's my chance. I've got to figure out a way to run for office. So first I ran for township commissioner in Abington uh, and Terrence and his sister who were so little at the time actually helped me, knocked on doors with me, sometimes in the rain, it was ridiculous, but they had fun. Uh, and that really impresses voters, by the way, when you bring kids along with you. Uh, and then I ran for state representative and I served for six and a half years. Uh, and then I had the chance in 2018 uh, to run um, for Congress. Uh, and, and I won. 
Uh, and I won with the help of a lot of other women. I ran alongside three other women in Pennsylvania. We went from no women in politics, uh, excuse me, at the congressional delegation level to four of us. We ran around calling ourselves the Fab Four, reminding us of, of the days of the Beatles. Uh, and uh, what a difference it makes. What a difference it makes to bring diverse voices to the table, no matter what you're doing, politics or otherwise. And so I guess what I would like to say um, now serving in Congress. And sister, thank you for mentioning the impeachment. Uh, it was a solemn honor, a solemn duty to serve as an impeachment manager, to be asked by an extraordinary strong woman. Nancy Pelosi literally called me and asked me, would I consider serving as an impeachment manager? I said, yes, right away. I just am sort of that person. And she said, Madeline, you might want to think about it. You might want to ask your family. I said, no, I, it would be an honor. And so I had that honor to serve on judiciary, sadly, through two impeachments. Nobody wants to impeach a president. Um, but in terms of the honor that it was uh, to make sure that we marked for history what actually had happened early this year, uh, the terrible attack on our democracy on a joint session of Congress. And so I hope we did it with honesty and dignity and integrity for American, American history. Um, what I wanna say is I wanna encourage anybody who has any interest in getting in the arena of politics and public servants, along with Co, I'd ask you to please join us uh, in anything you wanna do. Uh, don't worry that maybe you're not ready. Don't worry that maybe you're not the smartest person. I worried about that every single time I did anything I did. Uh, but I realized I wasted a little bit of time that way. Uh, so sister and uh, Lorraine Coons and all of the excellence uh, at Chestnut Hill College, thank you for lifting women for a, a century, frankly. Thank you for lifting girls and women and now young men uh, and men uh, to the excellence that they can become so that they can contribute to our communities. Um, thank you for instilling in them the courage and the confidence and of course the education uh, to move forward with the right values, uh, whether they go into industry or academia or public service or anything else. Uh, I've been inspired by some of the people you mentioned, Jeanette Rankin. I read an awful lot about Margaret Chase Smith as I was preparing uh, for the impeachment trial because how bravely she stood up in the era, era of McCarthyism and spoke her mind on the Senate floor so bravely. Uh, Rosa Parks, uh, Fannie Lou Hammer, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whom we just lost. But I also wanna say there are, are just excellent women all around us. Uh, and so in this uh, time of Women's History Month with just another day to go, I'm so honored and thankful to be here with you to have this conversation uh, that you might honor my public service. Know that the privilege is entirely mine. I love what I'm doing. And as Terrence's grandfather would say in my meandering path, he said, Mad, you're finally doing what you were built to do. And I believe I am. Uh, so thank you for this honor of being with you tonight. And I'd love to open it up to any questions or comments. Again, thanks, Terry. Thank you so very much for speaking about your personal journey. Uh, that's very meaningful. And, and your comments to Terry are so meaningful. He's my student and, you know, uh, so impressed. I'm as impressed with him as you are. <laughs> Let me just say that I know um, you feel very strongly about connecting with the audience. And so we would like to take this time now to have the audience you know, post their questions. There's a Q&A button at the bottom. And if you could um, you know, just post your questions there, I will be the moderator. I will ask the questions to the Congresswoman for you. And please call me Matt or Matt. I prefer it. OK, so the first question is from one of our students, one of my students, actually. And she wants to know, were you ever discouraged from running? Wow, that's a terrific question. Thank you for asking that. Mostly, I would say no. Uh, and I think maybe it has to do with what T Terrence described. We came from the Canaan family and the Dean family were people who were keenly interested in um, current events and politics and government. So uh, mostly, no. Sometimes you get some pushback um, and, and, it, and it's really quite political. It's just 
competition. Uh, maybe you'd rather wait, maybe you'd rather wait your turn, that kind of thing. But for the most part, I was very much encouraged by both men and women. Okay, the next question is from another student and she wants to know what barriers did you experience in your path to political success and how do you recommend women in the future avoid and ignore these barriers for themselves? The, the question almost answers itself, that sometimes you have to ignore barriers. Uh, people will put them up or circumstances may put them up, um, but recognize them for what they are. They are barriers sometimes uh, that have nothing to do with you, have everything to do with somebody else. Um, uh, I was thinking when I was first um, elected, this seems to have been a pattern with me, when I was first elected township commissioner, uh, and then when I was first elected to uh, the state house, I had an experience the first time I spoke as a township commissioner, literally, and the first I spoke on the floor of the house where the powers that be uh, didn't welcome my speaking up and literally, suggested that perhaps I didn't know what I was talking about and maybe I shouldn't be speaking at all. Uh, but what actually happened was in the case of being a, a, a township commissioner, I was challenging the status quo and it made the powers that be uncomfortable. I was trying to argue for greater transparency in contracts uh, and uh, making sure that we uh, put contracts out to a fair bid. And literally it was night one it was suggested to me that I didn't know what I was talking about, but I knew I would be more uncomfortable sitting there in silence than being uncomfortable being called out for speaking up. So that's a barrier. Sometimes there's a barrier where you just think, ooh, maybe I shouldn't really get uh, in, involved in this. At the state house, uh, the very first time I spoke on the floor of the house, the then speaker of the house suggested uh, that really freshmen should just sit and be quiet and learn. Uh, and he literally told me that out in the hallway after I spoke, told me it several times more. And I said, with respect, Mr. Speaker, I was elected to serve now. I don't know if I'll get to be a sophomore, so I will be speaking now. Uh, so, and, and that no longer, that climate doesn't exist anymore. Co served with me in Harrisburg. We've gotten past that kind of a climate, but there are barriers that sometimes you're, you're uh, imposed upon to be quiet, wait your turn, we really don't want to hear from you. Uh, don't, don't wait your turn. Don't wait for those barriers. Uh, you see more and more women are running for office. More and more women are elected. In 2018, when I was elected, did you see the beautiful mosaic that was our Congress? So many women, people of every ethnicity and color and uh, LGBTQ, you, you name it. In fact, I wore white tonight on purpose uh, for the color of suffrage. We all wore white. If you remember, I guess it was the State of the Union, uh, right after we were all sworn in in, in uh, January of 2019, we, all the women wore white uh, and celebrated uh, how many women had come to Congress. We even had one guy, Dean Phillips, bring a, and wear a white dinner jacket. Uh, so uh, there are barriers, there are gonna be barriers as though maybe you're not worthy or you shouldn't speak now. Uh, try to just ignore those barriers and have confidence in yourself. The next question comes from a professor from the political science department. And this is her question. That man in the arena reference was great. Were there any ways that your position as a woman in the impeachment arena made a difference in how the proceedings unfolded? That is a great question, and I don't know. I, I, I'd like to ask some of the co-managers or the senators, but I will tell you, Professor, that it was a very interesting experience. That was the first time I'd ever been on the Senate floor, and you, you might imagine I was uh, nervous preparing for it, and I paced a little bit outside in the lobby, a very field closed lobby, and something was funny. I, uh, In my nervousness, I looked up and saw a beautiful painting of a former uh, Senate leader uh, and it was painted by somebody named last name Dean. So I thought, okay, that's a sign. I'm gonna just calm it down here. 
When I got out onto the floor of the Senate, uh, I will tell you that in between presentations of the trial, senators would come down to us. Uh, so whether it was Diana DeGette or Stacey Plaskett or me, we, we were three women um, among the team. Uh, they came down and spoke to all of us, uh, but they certainly thought we contributed something. Um, maybe it was our personal experience. Maybe it was our experience literally being uh, in the Capitol at the time of the insurrection. But they complimented us all on being so diverse uh, and bringing something different to each part of our presentation uh, as lawyers, as people, as men and women. So I, I, I think, uh, I hope um, that the diversity of our experience uh, and our gender and, and uh, our service uh, did bring something that fleshed out the picture uh, as, as citizens and people who care desperately about our democracy. One of our students would like to know, were there times you felt defeated? Uh, I'm assuming that's sort of um, in a general way, or is that specific to um, the work of this year? I'm not sure. I don't know. There's no follow-up to that. So, um, um, okay. Generally, generally, he says. Generally, yeah, generally. generally. Um, yes. Co, you probably could do this better than I. I've been so darn lucky uh, as a, I'm, I'm going to focus on um, my uh, political work. Uh, and, and I would say also in my teaching, for example, uh, I just had the benefit of really great mentors and chairs at the English department. Uh, as I said, I was a lawyer in a sea of PhDs. And I remember my chair, whenever he would start a meeting and I'd be a part of it, He'd say, uh, yeah, I know, she's a lawyer, uh, she's not a PhD, but I wouldn't leave home without one. Uh, so he always lifted me up and made me feel welcome and valued because I was bringing something different to the table. I didn't have the same academic career, I had something else. Uh, I think the times, Ko, you should jump in here. I, I have some rosy glasses. If I ever did feel defeated, I, I just let it go. That's the way I am. For example, uh, in the impeachment uh, at the end of that, I, I made sure I was in the Senate chamber as each senator is required to stand and give voice to his and her verdict. Uh, and so you saw the vote was 57 and didn't meet the constitutional thresh threshold, although we certainly earned a majority of the vote. I didn't feel defeated by that. I wanted to, to have convinced every single senator but I didn't feel defeated by that. I felt satisfied that we've done the very best we could do uh, with the information, the evidence, the law, uh, our integrity. So I didn't feel defeated. Co, what do I do when I get defeated? Uh, you usually channel that into something greater. I mean, uh, I know uh, I was speaking with you and texting with you and calling you while the insurrection was going on. And oh. um, thankfully our staff uh, stayed home that day because we we were aware that it was dangerous and Madeline said it was important for her to make sure that there was no staff there and so um, thankfully we weren't there but Madeline was there and um, that was a, a horrific traumatizing experience and um, to be honest Matt, I didn't know how you were going to respond or react but um, you came back wanting to wanting to change and make sure that that didn't keep you down. So I know in the moment, um, you know, there were times that were scary um, and terrifying and rightly so, um, but you've usually been able to channel that into, into action. And so um, it's been a very, uh, very fruitful um, experience. I, I will say sometimes it's, it's tough to keep up because uh, if there's a disappointment, um, sometimes you just kind of want to um, have some downtime, but, uh, but you won't let us that you got to you, uh, keep us, keep us on our toes. So, um, so channeling that I think is a, into action is the way that you've dealt with that. Cause there have been moments that felt like a defeat. And I'd say that, uh, having the, the capital be taken over even temporarily is, is a defeat for democracy, but that was um, a pretty you turned, you're yeah. right. I turned it into an urgency of purpose. And I, I feel so bad because while we were being, um, uh, taken out and taken to a safe space, I was calling Co. I was calling Colleen. I was calling my family. I terrified everyone around me, but I, I kept trying to tell them I'm in a safe place. I'm in a safe place. But you're right, Co. I came out of that fired up with 
got to do something about this. Hmm. One of our students asks the question, do you think you're held to a different or higher standard than your male colleagues? Um, I think I am in terms of fashion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> guys get to come in in a old suit and you wouldn't even know. Um, uh, I, I think I certainly sometimes have felt that as a young lawyer, uh, as a young woman, uh, as, uh, as a lawyer, uh, as a state representative, uh, sometimes I did. I had to say that with Congress and with the number of women that came in and the wave that I came in, uh, I think that has been tamped down a little bit. Um, but uh, I'm very mindful and I try to mentor other young women that we are judged. We are judged by how we appear, how we are prepared. We are judged by how we speak. I imagine that many of you professors think about that. That if we speak too high and shrill, we're considered shrill. Uh, you know that Margaret Thatcher literally trained herself to bring her voice tone down so that she would not be perceived as shrill or unreasonable as a result of her voice and the, ten the tenor of it. Uh, so I'm sure we are still judged somewhat differently, but I'm also sure we are more um, deserving of a seat at the table or people recognize that. Uh, and it's actually the very best of, of uh, public servants who don't feel any threat if it's a woman uh, at the table or not. What are the biggest challenges you've faced that have helped you, helped to push you in such a way that led you where you are today? Adversity that became motivation. Um, uh, I, I, you know, one thing that I would say is um, my father died when I was relatively young and he was young. He was only 58 and I was 19, died suddenly of a heart attack. And something like that uh, reminds you of the urgency uh, of life uh, that you don't know how long you're going to have. Uh, and so uh, I always say I wouldn't change places with anyone because my father, Bob Dean, was the most magnificent person on the planet. Um, it, his uh, full life and then sudden death uh, uh, was an adversity to me uh, that I hope I turned into just some urgency of keep going. You got to keep going because you don't know how long you're going to have uh, to try to do the good you want to do. Um, so I, I, I would say that was uh, by far the greatest adversity in my life, in my young life. Um, uh, I also have um, recently released a book about another adversity that has struck our family. Uh, and it is uh, about uh, Terrence's cousin, my son, Harry. Uh, who is now in long-term recovery from opioid addiction. Uh, and we wrote a book and just released it in February called Under Our Roof. Uh, it's literally a, a nod to the expression that we say in our Catholic mass, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, roof but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Uh, it's a story of 10 years of Harry as he's in high school uh, junior high, high school, and the beginning of college, uh, falling deeply into addiction, and me trying to find out what is wrong, uh, and struggling and stumbling and drug testing him. And, uh, and so it was a terrible difficulty for our family, uh, a terrible adversity. Uh, and finally, in 2012, when I figured out what it was, my husband and I sat him down and said, are you ready to get some help? And he said, yes. Uh, and so he is blessedly in recovery. Uh, but we wrote that book to reveal adversity uh, and to reveal that it can happen under anybody's roof. Adversity, hard times, addiction, mental illness can happen under absolutely anybody's roof. Uh, and I, I do believe that, uh, you know, we're among the lucky. Harry has worked really hard. Um, but through that adversity, I know the bonds of our family are stronger. My understanding of 
of sickness and adversity, I, I hope is deeper and greater. Uh, and I hope I get to use that adversity for a purpose to try to modify our policies around healthcare and healthcare for addiction, to try to stop stigma and shame, uh, to try to change our criminal justice system for the better uh, in the recognition of mental illness and addiction. So I, I hope that sometimes I will try to use adversity and harness it for something better and, and along the way, learn more about myself, which is what I was forced to do, having lived that with Harry and now having had the joy of writing this book with him. Um, so uh, Terrence knows a little bit about that story and, and his, his fun cousins. So. One of our students wants to know, are there ways for these barriers to be brought down? What can our generation do to accomplish that? Thank you for that. And I, I will say to you, Professor, if any of the students wants to give me their opinion on things, I'm a former professor. I like the give and take. I'm sure they, they have more they could offer me than me answering all of their questions. So I'm really open to hearing, uh, Terry, what you and your, your colleagues and classmates think and care about. And maybe Terry, you can be spokesman for that. Um, I, or, I have confidence in the generation you are educating uh, that these barriers are falling as we speak. Uh, and I'll give you a reason why. Uh, I was talking about uh, Terry and his sister Caroline uh, knocking on doors with me. You know, it, it just didn't, it wouldn't occur to Caroline or to young women uh, that they don't have a seat at the table, that they shouldn't run for office. Um, my own granddaughter, who is nine, uh, Terry, I don't know if you know this, uh, called me to say, I'm running for student council, third grade, running for student council. Mama, I wanted to tell you about it, and I'll let you know after the Zoom vote. And so she called me after the Zoom vote. She won. And I thought, nine years old. Of course she ran. Uh, it, she, it wouldn't occur to her that maybe it's not her place. It's the boy's place. So I'm pretty sure the barriers are falling every single day. Uh, and 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 sister and Chestnut Hill College, thank you for being a part of uh, tearing those barriers down. Our vice president for academic affairs says, thank you so much for our students. Can you share with them what you see as emerging opportunities in public service? I think uh, public service at every level is available uh, to your students, to men and women. Uh, and that's something I stumbled through. I wound up uh, serving at the township level, at the state level, and now at the federal level. And I remember when I was running for township commissioner, I had the gumption for some crazy reason to ask Governor Ed Rendell to headline a fundraiser for me for township commissioner. Now, I had taken a course of his as a 50-year-old woman at Penn. Uh, he always thought I was auditing the class. And I said, Governor, I'm actually taking the class. I care. I'm going for the grade. I'm doing the homework. I'm doing the whole thing. In any event, at the end of that class, I was running for township commissioner. Uh, and I, I asked him to come and headline a fundraiser. And he said, what are you running for? Township commissioner. He said, that would be unprecedented. I was the governor. I said, I know. But literally, you taught this class. And you said, if you don't ask the question, the answer is definitely no. So I said, I'd learned something from your class. I'm asking. He said yes, and he came and he spoke to a packed house. Uh, Terrence, I think you were there. I know Caroline was there. A, a packed house and he was beaming, but what he said was so important. He said, elections matter. Elections matter at every level. What are you running for again, Matt? Oh yeah, township commissioner. It matters who your township commissioner is because they're going to be controlling uh, the sanitation, uh, the improvement of roads. Uh, traffic signals, stop signs, safe ways, uh, and so many other things. Uh, and so I always took that to heart. Uh, elections matter at absolutely every level, uh, and the opportunities exist at absolutely every level. So whether you're serving on school board, or you're running for Congress, or the United States Senate, or vice president and president, um, absolutely every level matters. Other places that you can serve, uh, of course, are, are diplomatic places. Uh, we need more women in, in diplomatic roles. 
Um, I, I always think of Madeleine Albright and how powerful she was as the first woman secretary of state and how smart and wise and everything else. So uh, the sky's the limit. There's no, uh, no office that should be off bounds for any of us. Who are the people you most look to for guidance to succeed in your role? And how did you come to have those people as a part of your dream team or circle? Well, you're looking at part of my dream team right here. Coach Eba. You know how I stumbled into Coach Eba? He was working at, well, as a student, working at Chestnut Hill Grill alongside my niece, uh, not Terrence's sister, but my niece, another Caroline, Caroline Dean. Uh, and um, he, I guess Caroline asked you to take a, a shift for her. Uh, and you said, well, what is it? What are you going to do? She said, well, I'm going to a fundraiser for my aunt. And he's, he volunteered to get somebody to take the shift. And he came to the fundraiser. Uh, sometimes serendipity plays a role. He came to the fundraiser. He didn't have anything to do. I remember Kathleen saying, nobody's taking pictures. Can you take pictures? So Po jumped right in, took pictures. Uh, it's one of the luckiest meetings of my life because having Co there, he then stepped in, volunteered on the campaign, worked on the campaign, then came inside and worked with me as I uh, uh, was state representative. He came with me to Harrisburg because I was made uh, chair of the Southeast delegation and I had the chance to hire a director for that. Uh, and then he came when, and, and ran all along with me the whole time uh, and um, came to Washington DC and served as my chief of staff. So he's one of a team of people that I have been so lucky to run into who bring such excellence and so much greater intellect and wisdom than I have. Um, so in some ways, uh, Professor, I've stumbled into it very fortunately. Uh, and in other ways, I don't know, just blessings and, and other things, but, but he's, not, he's not alone. I have a really terrific team. On the other hand, I wanna also say, um, I was worried that when I went to Congress that it would be a cold, unhelpful place uh, that others uh, among our caucus or colleagues might not wanna help. That's not been true at all. From Nancy Pelosi down to freshman members, uh, people, are trying to help others be the very best they can be because they know the demands of the place. Uh, so I have found mentors along the way there uh, and, and lots of mentors in my family and my own godmother, uh, Joan Cass and some wise people. Um, uh, I hope uh, that you all search for mentors. Uh, I hope that I'm, I, I, I really need to be better mentor to others. Uh, there's just nothing more powerful than having a smart mentor uh, to give you, to be a sounding board and, and to lead the way. Hello, Congresswoman Dean, someone writes. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to have this conversation with us. My question, oops, the question just disappeared on me. <laughs> okay, can we get that question back? My question okay. is, as a woman, how difficult is it to be productive in Congress, especially when there are so many polarizing viewpoints? I don't do it any other way than a woman, so I'm not sure I'm capable of figuring this out. Um, but your, the gist of your question is a question that Co and I raise all the time. How can we be effective uh, with such divides, such powerful divides? Uh, one of the things I've been trying to do, and I don't know if I'll be successful at it, uh, Sister mentioned that I was made uh, chair, one of the co-chairs of the Bipartisan Women's Caucus. So I'm the Democratic chair. Jennifer Gonzalez Colon is the Republican chair. Lucy McBath is my vice chair. She's fabulous and serves with me on judiciary, classmate of mine. Uh, and then a new member, a young woman, Kat Kamak, is the Republican vice chair. But you might imagine after January the 6th and the insurrection, uh, I thought before January the 6th, but I thought after January the 6th, the burden is on us to try to bridge the divides where we can. And I'm hoping to do that and have expressed this with the other women leaders. And what I have decided is try to bite off small pieces, um, small issues where we have something in common uh, and try to focus on that. 
uh, I, I, the other thing I bring to it and, and the question begs the idea of as a woman, how do you do that? One of the things I want to make sure that I don't do, and this really comes to me from being a professor who cares about words, is that I don't fall into the same pit that some people fall into, which is the name calling. I think it's just so unproductive. Uh, and so I'm trying my hardest to resist name calling and instead focus on the issues, focus on something we have in common. Um, but I, I will tell you, we'll see how this session goes. Um, I'm hoping we can be bipartisan. I was really proud early in the pandemic of the extraordinary bipartisanship that you saw happen with the original bills, uh, the CARES bill, uh, the family's first bill. Bipartisanship, there was a, an urgency and a sense that this is a pandemic that doesn't really give a hoot about your politics. Um, that has fallen off. You saw with the American Rescue Plan, we didn't earn a single Republican vote, which I regret. I, I don't think that's the right way for us to govern. This is meaningful legislation to help America's families. Um, so I'll report back to you later in the year, see if we can bridge some of those divides. Uh, and I hope, I hope you'll wish me well in that. Yeah, it's a real struggle. It's a very serious struggle. This is a question sent by Sister Carol. How do you navigate the turbulent waters created by the big lie? What can we do to influence the dysfunction in the Senate? That's a big question, Sister. I'm hoping maybe you'll give me some advice too. Uh, what I have always cared about was the truth and how hard it is to get the truth across. If you, saw, if you saw the opening of the impeachment trial, the chaplain for the Senate, his opening prayer was focused on truth, literally. And I thought that's the theme of the day. If we focus on the truth, regardless of what we were told or what we were sold, um, that maybe we can find our way through this uh, morass uh, and this vile um, um, hatred, frankly. Uh, there's just been a, a level of hatred and divisiveness. Um, so I keep lifting up the truth. I keep going to people and, and, and the wise words of somebody like Martin Luther King, who said, uh, you know, I choose love. Hate is just too great a burden to bear. Um, but in this time of um, easy disinformation, and sadly, disinformation from the very highest levels, mouthed by uh, such people who held the position of attorney general uh, to mislead us. We still have the, the legacy of the big lie. I'm hoping, and, and that was part of our hope with the impeachment trial, to try to put to rest the big lie, to reveal that court after court after court after court after court, Republican judges, Republican secretaries of state uh, revealed that this was a fair election. Uh, that there was no stealing of the election from the former president uh, and, and the illogical nature of the argument. Literally in Pennsylvania, folks went to court to throw out millions of people's ballots. If you do that because you didn't like who the person voted for for president, what do you do with the down ballot folks? What do you do with the congressional folks? Do you throw out millions of votes uh, legitimately cast for down ballot, there was just no logic to it. I think it's going to take a long time. Uh, and in terms of the Senate, uh, I have to tell you, I was slightly encouraged by the fact that we got seven Republicans to admit it, uh, that this was an insurrection incited by, sadly, the former president, that Americans attacked Americans on that day. Uh, it, it's, it's still, to me, stunning. Um, and, and you saw that the leader, the former leader of the Senate, now uh, Minority Leader McConnell, stood within minutes of his casting a, a not guilty vote and then said uh, that um, the president was morally and practically responsible. Um, that to me shows uh, an attempt at trying to have it both ways. And I hope that the American voting public will say enough of that. We need to be able to trust the truth coming from our elected leaders. 
but we have a painful scar, uh, just shredded scar on our democracy as a result of the big lie. Uh, hopefully now, and I, I am certain uh, that we've elected people who will demand the truth and not sugarcoat it from us. Okay, I'm being told we're out of time. <laughs> okay, uh, Congresswoman, we thank you so very much. We know that your time is extremely limited and uh, we are just so gratified that you were able to share an hour with us. We are going to be back on campus in the fall, full force, please God. And we hope one day that we could actually have you in the flesh on campus uh, to come back and report on you know, what's going on in Congress and, and the things that you've been doing to you know, make our lives so much better. Thank you so very much from the bottom of my heart. Take Thank care you. and good luck as you move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And uh, Terry, again, thanks for inviting me. It's pretty special that you did that for me. I look forward to coming onto campus. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, sister. Bye -bye. Thank you.